Nobel Laureate Professor George S. Mood, Yang Berbahagia, Datuk I.R. Dr. Haji Ahmad Zaidi Laidin, Vice President Academy of Sciences Malaysia, Mr. Uwe Morwif, Chairman International Peace Foundation, Wan Aldina Ahmad, Director of National Planetarium, Professor Dr. Muhammad Zamri Zainuddin, Moderator for this dialogue, Fellows of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, Representative from the U.S. Embassy, Representative from the uh, Belgium Embassy, Academics and Researcher from Institution of Higher Learning and Research Institute, Officials from Government Ministries and Agencies, Distinguished Guests, Members of Media, Ladies and Gentlemen, Welcome to the National Planetarium National Space Agency of Malaysia. First of all, I would like uh, to inform you that this National Planetarium are under renovation, so we are sorry for the inconvenience. Assalamualaikum, good afternoon and very warm welcome to this dialogue with Nobel Laureate Professor George F. Smooch on current issues in cosmology organized as part of the Malaysian Bridges event series facilitated by the International Peace Foundation and organized by the Academy of Sciences Malaysia in collaboration with National Space Agency of Malaysia. Now I would like to invite Mr. Helmi for recital prayer. <coughs> Academy Science Malaysia, Mr. Yubi Morawes, Chairman of International Peace Foundation, Professor Dr. Muhammad Zamri Zanudin, Moderator for this dialogue, Fellows of Academy Science Malaysia, Your Excellency the Ambassador of Russia, Representative from US Embassy, Academics and Researchers from Institution of Higher Learning and Research Institution, Officers from Government Ministries and Agencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and gentlemen, 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank each and every one of you for attending this dialogue session. I would like to welcome the Honourable Speaker, uh, Professor George Smoot to Malaysia. For your information, uh, the National Criterium is actually under renovation. We are in the process of upgrading our exhibition, so I would like to apologise for the inconvenience. I really hope that you could visit us again when our new exhibition is launched, uh, inshallah, uh, this uh, August. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Angkasa is pleased to work with Academic Science of Malaysia in organizing this dialogue session. This dialogue is one of the opportunity to promote the International Year of Astron Astronomy 2009 and the space science among students, public and young generation. The International Astronomical Union, IAU, has launched 2009 as the International Year of Astronomy under the theme, The Universe, Yours to Discover. It will be a global celebration of astronomy and its contribution to society and culture, with a strong emphasis on education, public engagement and involvement of young people, with events at national, regional and global levels throughout the whole of 2009. Malaysia IYA 2009 will be launched on the 13th of April here at the National Planetarium. It is hoped that through this kind of activity, the general public, especially researchers, will be inspired to appreciate and to understand the importance of knowledge on outer space, astronomy and its potentials, the technology needed to be developed and the benefits that we could gain from this program. To all the audience, I would like to wish all of you the very best to everyone and, and, and may we be benefit from this dialogue today. Thank you. Thank you, Panazwina. It is now a pleasure to call upon Yang Berbahagia, Dr. I.R. Dr. Haji Ahmad Daili Laidin, Vice President, Academy of Sciences Malaysia, to deliver his speech. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. And uh, a very good afternoon. Professor George F. Smoot, Nobel Laureate in uh, 2006. Your Excellency, Ambassador of Belgium, Mr. Uwe Morawitz, the Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, Professor Dr. Mubat Zamri Zainuddin, our moderator for this dialogue, and our stool is one of four or five cosmologists in Malaysia. So we are very rare breed. Fellows of the Academy, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon and welcome to this dialogue. And I'm glad people are still coming in. Indeed, this is the fourth in the series of dialogues with the Nobel laureates organized by the Academy of Sciences. Malaysia. Although I think Bridges is, is probably the ninth, I think, already. And uh, this program is arranged with this idea of pursuing this culture of peace. The Malaysian Bridges series of events is indeed a remarkable series as it provides a platform to hear from an impressive array of speakers ranging from Nobel laureates in physics, chemistry, medicine, economics, and peace, as well as renowned artists and several prominent and international personalities. And today, as we have been informed, we are honored to be able to hear from Professor George F. Smoot, uh, the 2006 Nobel laureate of physics, and the topic for us today is the current issues in cosmology. Ladies and gentlemen, I was privileged to hear him yesterday. And uh, he promised me he's not going to say the same things today. But I wouldn't mind even if he did, I wouldn't know the difference. Because it's really quite complex. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm sure you all will be in for a treat. As far as the Academy of Sciences is concerned, we have been arranging scientific orations, public lectures, science motivation sessions, as well as dialogues 
with the Nobel laureates. And this has already been organized previously by the Academy as part of the National Nobel Laureate Program, which is funded by government. As a matter of fact, we have over 20 uh, Nobel laureates from various fields of science that have come to Malaysia to deliver the lectures and contribute their expertise under this program, the aim of which is to encourage the achievement of excellence in science, technology and innovation and the development of high caliber scientists capable of doing good science and gaining international recognition. Now in this respect, the Bridges series of events definitely complements and add value to these efforts. The Academy of Sciences Malaysia II believes that in order to take the full advantage of the opportunities offered by the scientific discovery and the technological development of our economic and sort of social well-being, it is crucial that we facilitate the bringing together of public with the scientists and policy makers in a constructive dialogue to explore the emerging issues. Ladies and gentlemen, in this context, the dialogues serve as a very good platform to disseminate scientific knowledge as well as harness the advice of scientists and experts in the field of science, technology and innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, for me, I am rather sorry that this is going to be the last of the series of the previous program that is organized with the Academy of Sciences. Although there are another two events, I think, that is forthcoming, but it will no longer be with the Academy. And uh, as far as I am concerned, I am very touched and very impressed by this program. And I have actually expressed my wish uh, to Mr. Uwe Moravitz that it should be extended. But he said no. He had already programmed the year and the forthcoming years ahead uh, with other countries, with Cambodia, I think, the next target. And therefore, at least with this uh, series of bridges uh, with the Academy, this, unfortunately, uh, will be the last. But, ladies and gentlemen, what I was encouraged was what was mentioned that uh, apparently this is not just about one lecture. This is about a continuation of linkage between Malaysian scientists and the Nobel laureate. And uh, our Nobel laureate here today it told me that uh, the, he had something like 20 postdoc postdoctoral uh, scholars with him, but none from Malaysia. <laughs> and there are some from uh, Indonesia and uh, elsewhere. So there are some vacancies yet, <laughs> and uh, he would really like to see some talented cosmologists from Malaysia to be there. In addition, I was also told that he had helped to develop faculties and universities elsewhere. Meaning that they are not just here for the day, but they are given the right ambience and proper funding, they are also able to assist us in developing uh, our own universities and faculties. And I think this indeed is one of the best things that can come out from the British program. And for this, I, I'm really grateful to uh, the initiative that has been taken. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say a word on peace. Because unfortunately, the reality is that man is a belligerent animal. We like to fight. We love to fight. Even by elections, we fight. So, you know, uh, it seems to be a man's nature. And therefore, actually, in pursuit of peace <coughs> is against the man's nature. So, when uh, the International Peace Foundation starts to think of a way of bringing together this Nobel laureate to come and uh, share their experiences with us as a way to enhance peace, I think this is indeed a credible initiative. 
However, I should also include in this uh, piece on uh, expressing our gratitude uh, also to our host. Thank you very much, the planetarium. Many of us have never even been here before. I'm not one of those. I have been here. <laughs> Except that when I came here before, it was before our astronaut went. And so when I passed the exhibit just now, I was delighted to see that they have the pictures of our Sheikh, uh, Dr. Sheikh Muzaffar. So there are certain changes here. And in any case, I think this is something that Malaysians can be proud of. Ladies and gentlemen, I also would like to record our gratitude to Sam Darby. And surprise, surprise, I think uh, the International Peace Foundation was able to also garner the support of royalty. And I saw in the program a number of pictures from uh, uh, Malaysian royalties, from uh, Sultan Pera, uh, or, uh, I think uh, Raja Nazarin, Yamuli Raja Nazarin, has been very uh, prominent in this. Apart from the corporate side, uh, our Tun Sahitam, and the universities as well as agencies involved in making this a success. So to all of you, I would like to thank on behalf of the Academy of Sciences. And once again, I'd like to thank our victim for today, the moderator, Dr. Muhammad Tamri Zainuddin, being our sole representative on cosmology on behalf of Malaysia. Thank you. Salam on. Increasing ethnic, political, religious, and social conflicts and the helplessness to respond to them Without further stimulating the spiral of violence, show us peace is not a given goal. It has to be constantly learned, experienced, and created anew. Peace is not a passive state. Peace is a process which needs time, attention, and the participation of all of us. And peace begins with education. The seeds of peace need to be planted in schools and universities in the new generation. This is why the International Peace Foundation cooperates with major schools and universities, as well as with UNESCO in realizing this bridges program. We believe in the importance of the education and scientific community of Malaysia by bringing the knowledge and wisdom of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics to this country. What these highly in demand Nobel laureates normally see of a country our airports and hotels. They deliver their lecture, stay for one night, and leave. We have invited them here not only to speak, but to share, to engage, to listen. They come here not for one day or one event only, but for various dialogues in different parts of the country, without requesting any honorarium, because of their real interest in building bridges, because of their real interest in Malaysia. It is our hope that these are not the first and final visits of these Nobel laureates, but visits with many fruitful returns. To build long-lasting friendships and to start, for instance, research programs or other forms of cooperation with the local universities and schools. This is how bridges could develop into a long-term and sustainable success for Malaysia to strengthen education as a basis for peace. I thank the Academy of Sciences Malaysia and the organizing committee of today's event for taking up this opportunity of our cooperation and for inviting the 2006 Nobel Laureate for Physics, Professor George Smoot, to this prestigious institution. We look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Morris. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to start this session, it is now a pleasure to call upon Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dr. Muhammad Zamri Zainuddin, to introduce the Nobel laureates and later moderate the dialogue. Professor Zamri, we have a Thank you, Mr. Virus. Uh, Your Excellency, Honorable and distinguished guests, especially Professor George Fitzgerald Smooth, for uh, giving this opportunity for me today. It's a very rare occasion for me 
to be a moderator, and especially the speaker is a novel writer. So, um, without further delay, I'll take. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor uh, George Fitzgerald Smoot as our speaker uh, for today, and I hope the audience in this room will feel as many questions as possible after uh, Professor uh, Fitzgerald, uh, George Fitzgerald Smoot's uh, uh, speech. So, um, George. Uh, Smooth uh, received his bachelor degrees in mathematics and uh, physics in 1966 and a PhD in physics from MIT in 1970. He has been at the University of California, Berkeley and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory since 1970 and is the author of more than 200 science papers and of the popular science. But uh, what is more interesting is Professor George Fisher Smooth is the director of the Berkeley Center for Cosmology and Physics who was awarded the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics together with John Matter. And this is for the discovery of the black body form and anisotropy of a cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, just to give you some highlights on this thing, uh, this CMB, they call it, cosmic uh, microwave background, was first discovered uh, accidentally. In science, science is always accident discovery. <laughs> by uh, Anna Pangev and Robert Wilson, who are radio astronomers from the Bell uh, Laboratory, Telephone Laboratory you know, in New Jersey. And they, for the, the discovery, uh, they were awarded Nobel in 1978. And then from there on, uh, Professor Smooth, uh, with his team, some rather um, pioneer this uh, COPE, or what you call COBE, satellite, which is Cosmic uh, Background Explorer, to really map out the, the whole um, so-called what um, Penzias and Wilson discovered. So, um, and his work with his team, his effort, sending balloons up in space with his uh, what so-called um, U-2 spy planes, uh, trying to uh, find, finally, in the last 20 years, examining the faint but ever-present microwave ra radiation remnant from a time when light first became visible in the universe 300,000 years after the Big Bang and 15 billion years ago. So, um, and one, I hope in this lecture, maybe Professor Fitzgerald, uh, Professor Charles Fitzgerald Smoot will be able to explain the Planck Surveyor uh, mission, which is supposed to be launched in 2009, and also this SNAP uh, mission, which is Supernova Accelerating Pro, uh, that is the future uh, uh, things about this cosmology. So, without uh, further delay, uh, I'd like to call upon Professor George Fitzgerald Smoot to the floor. The floor is yours. So, to my hosts and honored guests, and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here, and uh, even have my talk started uh, before I was ready. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, it means at least it was working, and it takes a while to bring up the actual full display, and uh, we'll see that. But it gives me a chance to to keep moving, and uh, so I was asked to talk about current issues in cosmology. So I just made a shorter title about cosmology today, and you'll see on the front of it I have a picture of what I will explain to you is a picture of the embryonic universe, and we're inside of it. We're looking out as far as we can possibly see, and there we see the beginning of the universe, uh, the very early stages of the universe. So hopefully, uh, I won't spend too much on that because I told us was a more advanced audience, but I will talk about it. So. For me, the secret key of the universe is understanding the relic radiation from the beginning of the universe and using it as a tool to make maps and to understand the geometry and the contents of the universe and to get hints about how the universe itself uh, started. And I'm just advertising this book by uh, Stephen Hawking and his daughter Lucy. And uh, they conveniently gave a nice title to it. <laughs> and, uh, but in fact, this is a, a been a goal of mankind, started back uh, as far as there were shepherds tending their flocks and looking at the night skies. And through Babylonian astronomy, 
and the early Roman and Greek astronomy and through the early uh, Islamic and uh, Muslim uh, astronomers and then more recently with Galileo and Newton and most recently with Einstein, uh, shown in the bottom right. But we're beginning to have some perspectives about where we are in cosmology and what the future is for us that's very exciting. We've made tremendous discoveries and really understand a lot about the universe, but now we know there's even more problems to solve, more questions to answer that will tell us even more about the universe. And we have models, which you see, we divide up into various eras and very early times. We're probing the very beginning of the universe using mathematics and observations. And it's a simple picture we have. There's the beginning of the universe, which we refer to as the Big Bang, because we have an expanding universe. So this little umbrella that you see here is to represent what's visible to us in the universe down in our present today with a little telescope uh, or instrument that we build. And we look out <laughs> and we see nearest galaxies and stars. We look further back, we see the first generation of stars and galaxies. And we look back even further, we see a wall which is somewhere around 300,000 years after the beginning. Here it's now nearly 14 billion years, so it's very early. And we can see back to that and make an image of the early universe. The other thing we can see is what elements are around us, and we know those were formed when the universe was about 100 seconds old. So we're, we're really talking about going to extremely early epochs and try and trace the entire history of the universe right down to the present. So we can learn that. So the big step is that when we look out into space, we look back into time. And that's because the speed of light is very large, but it's finite. And the universe is even bigger than you would imagine. So when we look at, at objects around us we, that we can see with our telescope, we actually see them as they were years ago, or thousands of years ago, or millions of years ago, and in some cases, billions of years ago. And it's very simple. We look out around us to a sphere at distance t. We're looking back at a time distance t over c. The natural units are light years, so the natural times are years. It's an easy conversion. So here's the schematic of that. We, we're on the Earth. We're in the center, just because that's where we're having to be receiving the light. And if we look out to the sun, the light takes eight minutes to get to us. If we look at, say, the 15 year stars, it takes 10 years. And if we look to typical stars in our galaxies, it's thousands of years to hundreds of thousands of years. If we look to Andromeda Galaxy, it's two million years. If we look to typical galaxies, it's billions of years. And if you look back as far as you possibly can to this wall when the universe was hot, much denser, a thousand times smaller, then we look back 13.7 billion years. We look back to when the universe was embryonic. And somewhere behind that is the very beginning of time. And so I'm showing you a picture of what we see with the Space Telescope. So this is a picture that's remarkable for the fact that it's small, shows a very tiny part of the sky. But in this picture, you see nearly 2,000 galaxies. Right? Almost everything you see in this picture is a galaxy. There are four stars, but we can point them out. They have these little plus signs on them. But everything else in here is a galaxy. And a typical galaxy like this, which looks very much like our own galaxy, that is a spiral galaxy. It has roughly 100 billion stars. That is one followed by 11 zero stars in it, just like our own galaxy does. So there are a lot of stars in this picture, but they're in groups. They're in a little island universe, that is, they're in galaxies of their own. And some of the galaxies are very evolved, and they have roughly the same color, and therefore the same temperature as our sun. And some of them are much whiter and bluer, which means they're much hotter, and they're doing it. And because the universe is expanding, they're actually even hotter than they look at this picture because it turns out they're further away. Okay? They're just beginning and evolving. Okay. So now I, talk, I want to talk a little more about the history of the cosmic microwave background. It was discovered by Penzias and Wilson at Bell Telephone Labs using this antenna, which was designed uh, to look at the Telstar satellite to see if it was possible to have satellite communications. And uh, they were hired then to measure the brightness of the sky. If they had measured the entire sky with this big antenna, and at their wavelength of seven centimeters, they would have seen a, a line across here, which is our own galaxy, the center of the galaxy. Our galaxy is a disk. This is the map that we make nowadays. They saw a uniform glow, this green color, that came from the universe as a whole. And by their careful work, they were able to show that was the case. Uh, my team, back in 1992, we made an announcement that we looked here with much more precision, but with less 
angular resolution, and made a map of the sky. And here you see the galaxy saturating, and so thick and our beam smears it out. But off of the galaxy, we see variations that are very tiny variations. That is, the amplitude of these variations is a part of 100,000. The universe is almost perfectly smooth, but at a very, very tiny level, there are things. And you'll see these sort of cool spots together, a bunch of blue spots together, a bunch of warm spots together, warm spots together, cool spots together, cool spots together. And we were able to show those came from beyond our galaxy and beyond other galaxies and came from the very beginning of the universe. That, that's the key sort of issue. After that has been the WMAP satellite, which was a second generation satellite. It has radio dishes on it. It's the same basic idea, but now instead of having two small antennas that look this way, it has two big dishes that look at two different directions and you look for differences. And you map the sky, and now you can see the galaxy saturated again. Okay. Here there's enough resolution, here there's enough, resolu enough sensitivity, and here there's both sensitivity and resolution. You see the big spots, cold spots together, cold spots together, cold spots together, warm spots, warm spots, the same. The large scale structure is there, but now you start seeing things scale up on smaller scales. Those are beginning to show us what's happening in the beginning of the universe in much more detail. Here, we knew we could do it. We knew we could understand what was going on. And then, because we were able to, to convince people that we really did have something to measure, and we could really learn a lot more about the universe we were doing, we were able to have a second generation satellite, and this I'll show you in a second. We're about to launch a third generation satellite to make measurements of this. Okay, so I like to show this when we first made the discovery. This is the actual data of what the universe looks like. <laughs> you know, when, you're, when you take away the galaxy, this is real data. This isn't just a color picture. This is what the universe looks like. It is almost perfectly uniform. It is, it is very much more uniform. If you see polished marble, it's not as smooth as the universe is. Right? You know what a billiard ball is? Yes. It's, small, it's smoother than a billiard ball, the early universe, in terms of what's going on. And that's very impressive. So this represents a sphere that we're looking out to. I just it's folded flat so that you can see it. Now, if you look at the sun, this is an actual photograph of the sun. You will notice it's a sphere too. I made it a little bigger so it, you know you can see the details. You see a little fuzziness in here. The sun is actually not as uniform as the universe, and the sun is very round. It's actually slightly out of round because it's rotating, so it bulges a little bit at the equator. Right? But basically, it's nearly a perfect sphere with a little bit of bulge. So think about the difference in the early universe and this. They're both photospheres. When the light left them, they were both roughly the same temperature. The universe was a 1,000 times smaller and a 1,000 times hotter than it is now. So it was roughly 3,000 degrees. The sun is roughly 5,000 degrees. They're very similar in their behavior and so forth. And if you zoom in and show, make the contrast very much greater, you see the following for the universe. You see the surface of mass scattering? Now it looks like we're, in, we're inside of it looking out, but, but, but somehow when you project it, you're so used to looking at it here. But you see these very small variations, that is cool regions together, warm regions together. That means there's things on the scale. You can think of this as a warm region that's very large, and then small warm region bumps on top of it. You're seeing things on local scales. That is, is important. Now if I look at the sun in the same resolution, I see a picture that looks like this. Look how different the sun looks. Now this is in the hydrogen line. So it, it actually pulls out sun. You see, you see warm and cool regions. You also see flares where the magnetic fields are very different. So when you look at the sun and you look at the universe, you realize the universe is even more uniform than the sun. And yet, when you look with your own eye, you think of the sun as a pretty, pretty spherical, uniform kind of an object. And but obviously, when you look at this picture, you start learning something about the physics of the sun, what's going on in the sun. You look carefully at the other picture, you learn about what's going on at the very beginning of the universe. So we can do a spectral analysis. This is what you do with your ear when you hear sounds. You take the signal that's coming from, from the sound waves, and you turn it into how much amplitude there is at each frequency. You hear notes and music and so forth, you pick them out. Here, we're looking to see what size spots are there as a function of angle on the sky, right? And this is the angle on the sky, going from big angles all the way across the sky down to very small angles. And what you see is we think at the beginning of the universe it was very flat, but then the sound waves propagated to the universe, and the geometry of the universe, the material of the universe, pick out certain frequencies. 
So when you look back at that earlier map, remember the plots of the side of the trend. Those plots were nine tenths of a degree, just smaller than one degree. There's a lot of signal there. And there is at the harmonics. Very much like music uh, that you're hearing. Uh, the sound waves in the universe and the harmonics in the universe are that way. And that red line is a theory, or a model of what the universe is made out of. This is from the metal, the blue is from the WMAP satellite. Then there is an experiment that's on the South Pole that gives us information out here. And here's the theoretical predictions. So this is what we call a spectrum. It has energy as a function of the wavelength, right, or in this case frequency, and it has certain features. And from those features, you can learn about the properties of the universe. Okay. You can do the same thing for the sun. There are sound waves in the sun, and they have different modes. They have to be standing waves in the sun. And you get spots where they show up, and you can measure them. And then you can measure how that depends upon the frequency uh, and, and, the, and the which mode that you have in the sun, what, what angular frequency across the sun it is. And you see a series of lines of excited modes in the sun. We're doing a very similar thing. The sun actually has, because of rotation, picks out an angle and there's a slight slope. The universe isn't rotating. It doesn't have a preferred direction. So you average it out and you can only see it, you know, as a function of angular spacing. So we don't have to have a two-dimensional like this. We have a one-dimensional. So just like we can do any of the seismology, that we can look at sound waves going to the sun and see what the properties are inside of the sun, even though we can't see with light. The sound waves go through the sun. We can do helio seismology the way you do seismology of the Earth and see the core. You can then find the properties inside the sun. We can do the same thing for the universe, exactly parallel to helio seismology. And so we've had two missions, the COBE mission, which made the rough discoveries with the poor radio resolution. W map that had much better resolution, but it had to be smooth because it had, you had to use the longer wavelengths in order to remove the signal from the galaxy. And now, Planck, which we hope to launch at the end of this month, although last night I got an email saying it may be May 6th, so it's a fun night. It's been slaying, <laughs> so we'll have to see. It will have very high angular resolution and many more wavelengths and better sensitivity, so it should make a map as good as the best map we could have made with one, one wavelength, the W map. And also, you see the smudginess will be measuring the polarization. We know there will be polarization just as we know. When light scatters off the surface here, if you have polarized sunglasses, you will see as your ro ro rotate, the scattered light is polarized. The scattered light in your lunar system is going to be polarized, but only because it's not perfectly uniform. It's about 5% of the thing that will show up. But there's also a particular pattern that will show up if space time itself is made by a simple system that we think happens on your lunar. And that will end up causing what we call a, a curl mode. Uh, polarization as opposed to simple uh, radial modes. So we have a lot of things, a lot of exciting things we're looking for and we're hoping to do. And we're making steady progress. So we're in an era, what we call the great discovery. The greatest discovery was we had a tool instead of the early universe. This is what our map of the sky looked like. And now we're using that tool to actually tell us about this point in the universe. And we've learned quite a lot. And it's told us we need very many new things that we didn't know existed. But if Kobe had flown upside down, it would have made a map of the Earth like this. So basically, we discovered the continents, but we didn't discover the details of the continent. Here is our best map that we have today, which is comes from W map, and here is the resolution of the Earth using what we think the Planck satellite path. And you'll notice that if you had this map 100 years ago, or you know, the beginning of the 1800s, you would be the greatest geologist. You'd know where to look for minerals. You would know where look for oil, you could get all the oil leases and everything. You'd be very welcome today. Right? Now, if we have a map of the universe, we'd like to know where's the good stuff. Right? But look at the difference between these two maps. There's something very different about what's going on in shaping the surface of the Earth and shaping the core of the Earth. In physics terms, we say there are nonlinear processes going on that couples modes and give you sharp edges. In the early universe, every mode is kind of operating independently because everything's completely linear. And so it doesn't matter what representation you use, what, what choices you look, they, they're all independent. You know, you exchange from one to the other. It all stays linear. It all stays independent. The good thing about that is you can then think about doing the inverse problem. You know for linear systems, the inverse problem is, is a well-defined type solution. For this one, there are several different possible solutions as to how, how, the, how the world came into being. But we do know. That if we were able to probe about a factor 10 better than we're able to do now, 
there must be nonlinear clusters because gravity itself is nonlinear. And when we form galaxies out of this very smooth, very smooth, smooth, but slightly irregular random universe, we actually get long, complicated structures. That, uh, so gravity itself is nonlinear, and there's a little bit of gravity at the beginning of the universe, but there might be also the very forces that, that create space time out of nothing. They're going to be slightly nonlinear, we think, but we, we've yet to see that. And we're, and we're getting close. We actually are able to rule out many models of physics that people had, including a lot of string theory models, that, that, that would have made a different kind of universe. Okay, so here's a picture of the blank satellite. This is a picture that was taken in December when it was being assembled and tested to see what's going on. It's the stealth version of the satellite. The bottom is going to be black too. These are grooves to radiate heat to space. Right? We, we cool the equipment to make it much more sensitive. So we have optics, we have shield, we have a big primary mirror, which is in here, you see the primary mirror. And then we have a secondary mirror, but they're off axis. And then we have, we have a hundred little antennas in the focal plane that observe the radiation at different wavelengths to make the math. So here it is being tested. I have some pictures of it which I want to show you where it's actually now in French Guiana being prepared for launch. And uh, our goal is to put this satellite up out <coughs> what we call the Earth Sun L2 orbit, the place where the combined gravity of the Earth and the Sun cause it to orbit exactly in time with that. And then you can always keep the Earth and the Sun and the Moon behind you. So you can point your solar cells to the Sun and point your antenna to the Earth. And then you can scan around the sky and not see either of those and not have to worry about a lot of maneuvers. But this is not the only thing we're doing. I mean, when I started doing this, there were only two scientists looking for the cosmic migrate background. Now we have in, an industry. And we have two towns. This is one of them, the South Pole, CMB town. So there's six flights a day now that, that go in during the good time, the, you know, the summertime, which is the winter here, December here. And there is a South Pole telescope, which is to look at the cosmic microwave background. And you see the structure is existing. There is the ACBAR experiment that I showed you the data from, and BICEP, which is the polar experiment, on the science building. And then there's a separate building here, which has some other experiments. So this is cosmic microwave background experiments. It's club med for experiments. It's a little cold, even in the summer, even in the high Austria, like the Australian summer. It's like minus 40 C. <laughs> you know, the ice does not melt. You see the horizon is great, and you see the guys standing around having a good time. And, and uh, you know, you've got electricity, you've got liquid helium, liquid nitrogen. You know, you have data data that you can take, and you get meals, and, and they have bingo night, <laughs> right? The other place there's a city is in the Atacama Desert, which is on the border between Chile, Paraguay, Bolivia, Argentina. So here's Santiago. And here's this, this place right up here where there's another cosmic microwave background city. So you'll notice these are not the most hospitable places for people. It's because the best experiments are doing where they're very high and very dry. The South Pole is a desert, believe it or not. Even though there's a lot of water there, it's a desert because it's so cold. It almost never, there's almost no precipitation. The Atacama Desert, it rained every 500 years whether we need it or not. And so here's a quick, whoops. That the movie won't show, but I'll show you the picture. This is a picture of one of the sites in the Anaconda Desert. You will notice no trees, no flowers, no insects, nothing. It's desert. I mean, it's, and if it doesn't rain, it doesn't, there's not much life. And there's one of the sites. There's a whole series of sites. This one's in the past, right? This is a typical thing you see to see these. You see, you know, a telescope. This is the Anaconda uh, Cosmology Telescope being put, put together. So there's actually six sets of telescopes being built here, just like there were five in the South Pole. We've actually created an industry with cities, right? <laughs> Not big cities, but cities. And those are to, uh, to make very careful measurements of the be very beginning of the universe in all possible wavelengths and all possible modes, both in terms of polarization and in terms of intensity. And you go to that because there's so richness to, to learn. It's sort of a goal run, a modern goal run. So that tells us about the beginning of the universe. That's as early as we can get. And I told you if we could make measurements at each sort of spherical shell around, we would do that. We've been making measurements in the nearby shell. So this is a picture 
I apologize, I showed this yesterday. I won't show all This is a picture that has only a billion galaxies in it, just the local neighborhood. Remember, there's 100 billion galaxies, so this is less than one hundredth of a percent of the galaxies that we can see, and which is a small fraction of a problem with the number of galaxies that are in our universe. So every point on here is a galaxy, and uh, what happens is you take pictures, and as the Earth rotates, you get a fan across the sky, and you get a fan, and you then take each thing that you think is a galaxy, throw away the stars, and just take the galaxy, estimate the distance to it, and you plot it up in three dimensions, and you have that. And I have a movie that fans it around, but I just want to show you the fly-through movie so you can feel like you're in Star Trek. <laughs> the mean distance between galaxies is such that light takes two million to four million years. It will take us a fraction of a second. So you ready? <laughs> this is a fast trip through the survey. And you'll recognize some of the galaxies are elliptical and some are spiral, and some we have the colors for. So we have a huge catalog. This is like a modern day library of digital set of, set of books, and you take your trip electronically. But you can see some of the galaxies. Now we're going to swing out and look back at the survey. And you'll see the fact that it's a big fan shape across the sky. And it's flipping that galaxy. You see it's a, you'll see it's a big fan across the sky because the beam slightly spreads as you go out. This is a fixed angle in the sky. And you'll see where the galaxies are in sort of, th in sort of the, the three dimensions. You'll see there's huge voyage. At this point here is more than 500 million, 50, I'm oh, sorry, 50 million light years across. And <laughs> it's not my phone, is it? So this is a thing, a structure we call the gray wall. It looks like a line of galaxies, but it actually extends in two dimensions. We know that it has over a million galaxies in it. Exactly how many we don't know because we only have samples. We only have slices to it in a couple of different places. And so there are places where there are a lot of galaxies all clustered together, and there are places where there are even a huge number, tens of thousands to hundred thousand galaxies clustered together, and those are superclusters or super superclusters. And then there's voids, and so it's very it's very interesting, right? When you look at this compared to the early universe, which I showed you was all green, it was so uniform, and then when I showed you the details, even the small variations, they're all kind of random. Here, there is what we call the cosmic web. It's lines and filaments of galaxies and walls of galaxies. Very different. It's more like the surface of the Earth than it is like the beginning of the universe. And we have an idea how that happens. We have simulations that tell us if we look on the large, very large scale, or this bottom one, so the universe looks very uniform. But as we zoom in, we see this sort of random filaments and so forth. And when the filaments come together in this big web, then we get a big intersection there. We will get a cluster of galaxies or a supercluster of galaxies or a, a, a really large thing in it. So I'll show you another fly-through movie. It's much better, you will agree with people that saw this up yesterday, it's much better when you get to see the plan, you can see what's going on. But in this one, we've added a new ingredient that we've had to do, which is dark matter, which is really invisible matter. It's, it's more transparent than this, okay, by far. And it forms structure, and then later on, the ordinary matter, which interacts with light, falls into those structures, and because it interacts with light, it can dissipate energy and collapse to form stars and galaxies. So you see the stars and the galaxies at the center of these dark matter halos. So it turns out we know that the ordinary matter, the matter that you see around this room, that's only about 4% of the universe, and the dark matter is somewhere around 23%. So there's roughly a factor of six or ten between the matter we're so happy and familiar with that we are made of and the matter that makes up most of the universe. This is just zooming in on that one section. And this is how we do the simulations. Whoops. We start with a pretty uniform universe. The universe is expanding and gravity is pulling in. And so what happens is we have random fluctuations out of the universe. The most extreme of those random fluctuations, the, like flipping a coin and getting five heads in a row, they show up and make little, little pieces first, and then you start getting the filaments forming, and the filaments link together, and you get this kind of a structure. So this is just dark matter alone, no, no dissipation of ordinary matter. I think I'm making this go. No, I'm sorry. I started to go and I didn't do it. Huh? So maybe I won't show it to you, but you, what you would see is first, it's 
taking a while. It's just exciting to think about. Cool. Um, but what you what first see is just sort of little places, little spots starting to coalesce, and then those little spots arrange themselves in filaments, and then the filaments arrange themselves in a big web. And it's the same. It's the it's the stuff that shows in this in this other simulation I was showing you. I lost control here. This other simulation that I was showing you, this simulation that gives you the structure that we zoom through. So sorry about that. So when we do the full up simulation from the very beginning of time, which is the sphere around, we have a section of around on the far side on the right, we we see first nothing but sort of a uniform glow from the from the hot uh, situation, and then the first sort of spots start showing up, and they link together and they make a web. And they begin to form the gal. Then the order of matter falls in. They begin to form the galaxies and stars that we see today, and the planets. And roughly at this time, at a time which is roughly 4.6 billion years ago, somewhere on this sphere, this is when the solar system began to form. And and the, it was the second, third generation star material. That, that, that made out of. And then a strange thing happened. The universe started to increase its rate of expansion. And that cut off the formation of any additional new structures. Only the things that are already formed could continue to evolve and go on. So our galaxy gets to hold together. So but we get this cosmic web here, which has the stars and galaxies on it. They're slowly evolving. So we have this model of the universe, where the universe that is everything we can see today, all 100 billion galaxies that we can see today, perhaps more, were once in a region that was much smaller than the size of an atom. And it was dominated by quantum mechanics. There were uncertainty quantum mechanical fluctuations. And those are the things that we actually see when we look at the map of the real universe. But they've been stretched by the fact that the universe went through an accelerating expansion phase. They were stretched up to macroscopic size, so we can see them easily with our eyes here. And then since then, the universe has continued to expand. And it's taken things that were sort of the size of this room and turned them into the size of galaxies, or clusters of galaxies, I think, larger. So in this, in this idea, all those 100 billion galaxies we saw were once part of the 100 billion quantum mechanical fluctuations that exist in the region smaller than that. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a galaxy and a quantum fluctuation, or a cluster of galaxies with a quantum fluctuation. Because you get quantum fluctuations on top of quantum fluctuations. So that's why you get some big ones and some little ones on the one the quantum fluctuation now. And there's a time period from the time the universe cools down enough that the light is free and the matter is free until well, finally the matter can drift in onto the dark matter and light up the stars. The first generation of stock, this happens at roughly 400,000 years, and roughly a factor of 10 later, 400 million years, sorry, roughly a factor of 1,000 later, the first stars start to appear, it's not a linear system, and then they start evolving into the more mature galaxies. You start out with small galaxies and clumps of stars, and they merge and form together to make them bigger, richer galaxies. So we have a pretty clear picture. And all we had to do was add some new ingredients to the universe. The dark energy to cause the universe to accelerate. The dark matter to cause the structure for this to fit. And then we had the ordinary matter being 4%, which we get to make cell phones and other things that should be a cell phone. So there we are in terms of what's going on. Now we know we got to explain what the dark energy is, what the dark matter is, and why did the universe Go through this period of accelerating expansion at the beginning, just like it's going to be accelerating expansion again. That is the that is three of the great I have a list of eight questions if you guys ask the questions at the end. That, uh, the great questions that we have, four of whom we know must occur, right? We know there must be something like inflation. We know there must be dark matter, and then we know there must be dark energy in order to explain the very universe we see. And that's that's a big improvement because we know in physics only four forces. And now we're calling for three new forces. And we have strong evidence they must exist. The question is, what are they? So we're looking for bright young guys. That's why I'm saying we're recruiting students. We're looking for people who are going to help us solve the problem and really understand what these forces are and what, what, what how the universe is made. So I want to stop at this point, and you, because I think it's better for you to be able to ask questions and have a dialogue. I have more material. So if you guys are bored, I'll, you know, so the questions we can go back to looking at pictures. But, uh, I think it, it's, I, I think it's better if you guys can ask questions yeah. about what you'd like to know. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor John.
I think you have been enlightened by the talk of uh, 